There's a creative genius within us all. But how do we wake it up? My guest today will share how to master discomfort and gently find your way to your most authentic life. Whether you're an artist or not, this episode is for you. Have you ever felt there's something more you're supposed to be doing with your life, but you're not sure what? Welcome to She Made It, the podcast that uncovers the journey to living a life that feels more like you. Hello, Clara. How are you today? Oh, I'm great. How about you? I'm I'm very, very, very excited for people to get to listen to this conversation. It's so different and so helpful in so many, many ways. And one of the great like parts of the conversation, um, it was when Nancy and I shared a little bit about our first creative memory, and she shared real real great details about hers. And so it got me curious about, you know, how important those first creative memories are and how they sort of the messages that we receive when we were children, how they influence who we are today as a creative, as an artist. So I'm just dying to hear what is your first creative memory? There are a lot that come to mind. I think I have a memory from probably before I was two. Oh, I thought you were going to say before you were born. Oh my gosh. (laughs) There are people who claim to have those memories. I am not one of those people. (laughs) Um, Of staring at this painting in my parents' condo. And I think I later called it the pretty picture, but I just remember staring at it for hours. And then the other one that comes to mind immediately was, which is a little bit seasonal since we're approaching the holiday season, is I had, when I was probably four or five, a Christmas shop in our garage, and I made lots of Christmas crafts with my mom, and then we opened our garage, and it was my little store. So really funny, because I was invited to go shopping at the Clara Christmas store. Oh, were you? I was. I don't think I was able to make it, though. I think I tried to shop online, but you weren't quite set up for that yet. Yeah, it was probably (laughs) the year 2000, so. (laughs) Uh, No, I do remember that, your little entrepreneurial creative business. Yeah. Yeah, and that's funny because one of the things that I, one of my first creative memories was um, I have... This, I don't think this is my very first, but a very significant one was also around the holidays. I would always make presents, make gifts for people. That was like my favorite thing to do was make homemade gifts. Yeah, I love that. Today's guest is Nancy Hillis, a Stanford-educated existential psychiatrist and artist. She began her journey as a lover of the arts, but then she chose a career in the medical field before being called back to art. Now, with this unique blend of her background in psychiatry and art, she helps people overcome self-doubt. She helps them nourish their creativity, create with joy, and make art they love through her process called The Artist's Journey. So welcome, Dr. Nancy Hillis, to this episode of She Made It. Thank you so much, Elle. I'm so excited to be here. Yeah. And Nancy, where are you today? Where are you recording from? I'm in Santa Cruz, California, Northern California, Okay. uh, not far from San Francisco. Okay. Yeah, you did. I know from reading about your studies and your sort of your journey that you... um, you ended up in San Francisco as part of your, I would say, maybe return to yourself as an artist. Would that be true to say? That's true. So I, I, I grew up in Arkansas, and then I went to San Francisco. I'm a physician, and that was part of my journey of being a physician. And there I also discovered or rediscovered the creative within myself and, and lots of dreams about how that might go. Yeah. I would love to know and kind of kick off our conversation today with if you could share your first creative memory. Oh, wow. That's a really good one. 
<laughs> oh, yes. Okay. It comes back to me. So, one, well, there are actually several. I'm not sure which one's first, but one of them is that I would, I love the colors red and purple as a child. And I had the, you know, box of crayons, 64 crayons or whatever, 72. And I love those colors. And I would color the bricks on the wall. My father had built uh, about a 26 foot long wall of old used bricks. And I love the variation of those colors and those bricks. And I thought that I would embellish those further with red and purple marks of crayon. <laughs> <laughs> and and was that was that celebrated or was that was that um, were you scolded for that? Actually, I think it was celebrated. My mother thought it was hilarious. She never could catch me. I would do that when she was taking a bath or something like that. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Like a little a little a little uh, elf would show up and yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah, and I also um I read a little bit I read your bio on your website and and I also um I read about the quilting and I love the visual image of quilting and you as a little little child sitting watching I think who was it was it your grandmother that was quilting yes so we would go up to the farm at Tomahawk Arkansas and granny and papa would be there and I was four years old and my my granny loved to make quilts from clothing and I loved the idea of hand sewing and I did various pieces, very colorful pieces together into crazy quilts. <laughs> hmm Yeah. Yeah. I did a play. I did a musical because, you know, as a performing artist, um, musical theater is sort of my love. And there's a musical called Quilters. And it's six women and sort of the time period is that early pioneer, the journey across the country to California and what they had to endure, but the but the common connection between the women was the quilting. And That's really interesting. Yeah, yeah, and the history and like you said, taking the old clothing and making something beautiful out of the old clothing. Yes, it's it's deconstructing and reconstructing, and we do that in art and in life, mm -hmm. and refinding something magical within the raw materials is yeah. interesting. So, Nancy, you started um, our conversation when we when we talked about San Francisco that you are a doctor, and you know, here we are talking about your art and your beginnings as an artist, even as a young child, finding joy and creating. Share a little bit of your journey. Like, how did you end up being in medicine? And then I'd love to hear the journey back to yourself as the artist. Yes, it's been a very circuitous journey. I have a great interest in biology in evolutionary biology, in sciences of all types, physics, chemistry. I was a chemistry major in college. And kind of the intersections of art and science. And so that part of me, the scientific part of me, was very drawn to learning about the human body, the physiology, and medicine, and how we could help others through medicine. And so I went down this path of becoming a physician that path became very circuitous. And what unfolded was in the beginning, I did an internship in internal medicine. Then I was, I went to Boston and I was at the Brigham and Women's Hospital and diagnostic radiology, where you look at x-rays and MRIs mm -hmm. and CTs and that sort of thing and ultrasounds. And then I realized that I, I wanted to come back to the West Coast and I came back to San Francisco originally and then and then ultimately down at Stanford that I was missing, you know, talking to people. And I really knew that deep down I was kind of a natural for psychiatry. Mm -hmm. I'd always been helping people my whole life and it, that came very naturally to me. And so when I left the Brigham, when I left radiology, 
a wonderful neurosurgeon there, John Shilato, who is kind of an ominous grease of neurosurgery, said to me, Nancy, you're going from shadows to nuances. Oh, interesting. From the radiology. Yeah. Because in radiology, we talk about shadows, right? The dark light shadows, the dark light patterns and contrasts and edges. And from that to nuances, I thought that was stunning how he said that and the nuances of psychiatry. Right. And I think, I think that when I was at the Brigham, I realized I really missed, I was missing something deep and that was a kind of very creative approach and I was missing the arts Mm -hmm. and I dreamed of painting abstract watercolors. I I even took a a creative writing course at Harvard while I was there. I was living in Cambridge. So this, there was this yearning that was building for the artist in me. Mm -hmm. So it kept building. Yeah. And even in your, um, again, in what I read about you and that you're, you, you spoke about as a child and, and looking at Rembrandt and doing the paint by number colors and dreaming of a life that didn't yet exist, that, that you believed was possible, which is so fascinating that not only psychiatry, but you're, you're in existential psychiatry. Yes. Oh, yes. That is, yes, you're bringing that back for me. I would stare at the paintings or they were reproductions, Rembrandt reproductions. And it was girl with a broom and man with a golden helmet. And they, they were on either sides of these walls opposing one another. And the uh, humanity in their eyes just seemed so alive. And that's the thing about Rembrandt. I'm in love (laughs) with Rembrandt Mm -hmm. and the humanity in their eyes. It felt like they could come out of the canvas so I would stare at them for hours and imagine them in my life. And that held for years. And I believe that we can have these early dreams, something that speaks to us. I think Camus wrote about this, about, you know, there are these moments in your life, you know, when your heart first opens, what is that that opens you? And that we spend our whole lives trying to get back to that which where your heart first opened. Right. That a person's life. Yeah. That a person's purpose is nothing more than to rediscover. Right. Isn't that what that says? Yes. That's exactly right. To rediscover that which opened your heart. And, and I believe that kind of the visual, you know, whether it was the quilts or the colors or the Rembrandt reproductions or the paint by numbers, and I love the smell of the turpentine <laughs> and, and the magic that unfolded. <laughs> yeah, you know, as you painted there, and so uh, that was very powerful. And I believe that if we can remember those first inklings, those first feelings of when your heart first opened, that which excited you, and refine that, mm-hmm. it's waiting for you. And sometimes Mm -hmm. it may be years, it may be decades, but that's okay. It's still there. Mm -hmm. And what is existential psychiatry? Well, existential psychiatry is based in existential philosophy, and it's really getting at the human condition that we grapple with the life, birth, death, life cycle that we are mortal. And so what is it that is meaningful and how do we move towards our most meaningful and alive life? Mm -hmm. I had the great honor to work with really the kind of father of existential psychiatry at Stanford, Irv Yalom. And it was such a powerful experience to be able to get to know Irv and work with him. And he asked me to be a co-therapist in a group therapy sessions that he was running. And it was just so amazing. What a lovely and humble man and brilliant as well. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so as a psychiatrist and having these deep experiences with your teachers and um, I'm sure 
learning about yourself as well. How did that help you find your way back to abstract art? Well, I think that as I was working with these concepts of existential psychiatry and working with patients and sitting in session and really observing how people were trying to, you know, live their most meaningful lives and it reawakened in me, you know, what is my most meaningful life and where do I want to go? And so I think that that helped. I think also that medicine and psychiatry in particular is very much an art. I mean, there's an art and a science to it, but there's a lot of art to Mm -hmm. medicine. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Especially psychiatry, when you're talking about the unknown of, I mean, each, each human being is so uniquely and individually made and stepping into kind of like the inner side of the human and how do you support them? And um, yeah. And how does creativity play a part in that? Because I feel like that's where you really, that's how you, that's how it's all sort of come together is there's the existential psychiatry. There's that deep inner work. There's that expression of ourself. Um, so what what is that to you? What I guess what is creativity to you? Which that's a big question. I know. <laughs> yeah, it is a big question. <laughs> well, you know, it is to me. It's about getting at meaning and. Um, finding the aliveness that is in you that gets expressed through, excuse me, discovery, tapping into the mystery of what it is to be alive and to be Mm -hmm. a human. And that is so exciting. Mm -hmm. Um, And I believe that creativity is threaded through our lives. We're all creative and there's so many ways of being creative And I'm particularly struck by bringing together disparate elements such as various intersections from science and art. Mm -hmm. And and for example, this is a creative conversation right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because we don't know where this is going, do we? (laughs) No. And I love that. I love that. Yeah. You know, years ago, I had a a television program I put on for a while. It was a community television program called Creativity and Consciousness because I got very interested in interviewing artists on their creative process. And the way I set that up is to literally step in there not knowing what was going to happen. And to me, this is the ultimate in creativity is to not know. It's stepping into the unknown and... It really is getting at ultimately something I've been talking about recently called the adjacent possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I actually was going to ask you, I I wondered, you you have so many, um, so many valuable bits of information, you know, you, and I want to get to the adjacent, what do you say? It's the adjacent possible. Is that what you said? Yeah. Yeah, but before we go to that, what what I'd love to hear from you, from your experience of talking to artists, helping um, inner artists be birthed and come forward, do you believe that we li- we're living creatively starved? Do you believe that's an epidemic? And and if so, why? Right. Well, I do think that, particularly here in the United States, that. This is a problem. That is that oftentimes I think the arts get shut down in various places. And we do know that by about fourth grade or age 10, many children get shut down creatively. And some of that is that the arts are taken away, that somehow it doesn't seem to be as valued as much in many places. And, and and it's happening right at a time when the child is in the grade school years kind of very interested in rules and constructs. And so it's like almost like the perfect storm of shutting down the child creatively. And yet we need creativity so much for innovation, for 
uh, solutions, problem solving, um, you know, anything from dealing with COVID-19 to other medical discoveries to material sciences, all kinds of things. And just also for a sense of meaning and aliveness in one's life Mm -hmm. and an understanding cultures and uh, understanding the deeper existential issues of life. Art reflects that art is a mirror of our lives personally, and also as a society. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And through, through your book, the artist's journey and your course, that's sort of what you do, right? You help people get into, you know, what are the barriers? What are the blocks? How do we stay open to our impulses? How do we create a cult cultivate that mindset of experimentation? Yes, very, very much so. And everything I do, whether it's the books, the courses, any kind of workshops, is very much about the inner journey, the inner landscape, your psychology affects everything. And what do you feel is the biggest barrier people experience? I believe the biggest barrier is Mm self-doubt. And and there are variations on the theme of self-doubt. And so we yearn for something. We learn, we yearn to have our most meaningful life and yet we're afraid Mm-hmm. And self-doubt rises up on its hind legs and stops us oftentimes. And it can look like inner criticism, second guessing, overthinking, procrastination, avoidance, resignation. Mm-hmm. Imposter syndrome. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yes. Fear of making mistakes, fear of mediocrity, mm-hmm. fear of uh, of what others will think, a focus on external validation rather than internal validation, Mm -hmm. not giving oneself permission to stand in your own shoes and take those risks. And uh, there's a kind of perfectionism and fear of failure. Mm -hmm. And yet I say that actually we want to embrace so-called failures and mistakes and ugly art. Mm-hmm. That's Ugly art. Juices. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I made some of that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's very, it's so valuable because mm-hmm. I believe that ugly art is oftentimes the nascent embryonic forms of new work that's emerging, that's trying to be born in your mm-hmm. art. But there's the issue of trust. Like, how do we trust that? Because the inner critic is like, is hammering against that self-trust. So there's that conflict. It's like the, you know, the two angel devil on your shoulder fighting against yourself. I guess, how do you help a person or even yourself cultivate self-trust? Deal with the challenges of creativity, the anxiety of, you know, experimentation. Yes. Well... This is, first of all, it's what we grapple with continually, no matter where you are on your life cycle as an artist or person, it comes around in spirals. And so if you kind of know that this is going to show up in various forms and to understand that when you say yes to your dreams, when you say yes to what you yearn for, when you say yes to stepping into the unknown, you are plunging yourself into perils. And those perils are exactly what we're talking about here. Self-doubt, inner criticism, second guessing, fear of mistakes, perfectionism, all of that. That this is a natural uh, process that all the great books, stories, films talk about this. Uh, Dante Alighieri, my favorite from the Divine Comedy in the Inferno, said, in the middle of the road of my life, I awoke in a dark wood and the true way was holy lost. So you plunge in, right? Dante, this was seven centuries ago. Yeah. You're lost. And this is, and then Virgil showed up, the great pagan poet Virgil to help light the way. And so guides show up, friends, other artists, 
uh, mentors show up. And we also ultimately have ourselves because the other part that we're talking about here is that in all these great stories, there's the moment, the dark night of the soul, Mm -hmm. the moment when you must face yourself. Mm -hmm. And that is pregnant with possibility of the transformation on the other side of the greatest self-doubt when you face yourself and you wrestle down the dark angels of despair and self-doubt is that the possibility by facing yourself is believing in yourself, Mm. is trusting. It's like going to that place where you allow yourself to trust yourself. And even if you do that a tiny bit, Mm -hmm. There, that is so powerful and that you're building this repertoire of self-trust and then you return back to your life and then it begins again. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. So what I love about, for first of all, it feels um, like there, there's a tiny bit of me that's sad <laughs> that you don't ever really arrive at that master of trust, you know, that it's, that it is a process, a spiral, like you said. And, and, you know, we talk about the hero's journey and it's the hero's journey and it doesn't, it's the hero's journey again and the hero's journey again. (laughs) And that's right. And it's that continual process of spiraling and hopefully you're spiraling up. And even if you slide down, you can still stay on the spiral well, you know, it's interesting, you know, because this maps onto something very interesting to me from calculus, interestingly enough, and it's called asymptotic functions. And this is a curve where that goes up rather steeply where you're going from one node to a next. And as you go up that curve, it starts to flatten out at the top and it, you never quite get there on this curve, but you get closer and closer and closer, tiny, tiny, tiny increments. And that maps on to me of this transformation. It's a continual evolution and it's part of life. We never quite completely get there because if we did, perhaps it would be all over. Yeah. Oh my gosh. So then it's about mastering the discomfort maybe yes you nailed it you nailed it right there it is embracing it is embracing the discomfort it is knowing it's coming and and actually that's fine in fact even saying fantastic here it comes Mm -hmm. the discomfort the ugly art the Mm -hmm. because when we create this ugly art it feels uncomfortable we doubt it Mm-hmm. And yet I've had experiences personally, and I actually I talked to numerous artists who have had this experience where you create a painting, for example, and you hate it and it's ugly and you're embarrassed by it. It's unfamiliar and you put it away. And sometimes it might be a month later, it might be 10 years later, you refind it and sometimes you are astonished by it, mm. wowed by it. But it's, you see, it's kind of out there in your future. Mm-hmm. Perhaps you're not quite ready for it at the moment, but it has me- a message for you, just like dreams have messages for us. And if we can write down those dreams and not necessarily reduce it down to an analysis, but rather let it live and let it be and let it have innumerable possibilities of what meaning, it may speak to us for decades. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, so I guess the question is, how do you build the resilience to stay in it? And do we ever get in, you know, because you hear people talk about the flow. Yes. Yes. Well, I, I believe it's helpful to, uh, first of all, understand what we're talking about here and to get support for what we're talking about here, which is embracing the discomfort, which is embracing the unknown, which is embracing vulnerability, all of that to have a community where you can talk about that is very helpful to have someone, a guide like Virgil is helpful Mm -hmm. to have books and materials to help you is helpful. And then it really becomes about getting in there and 
and grappling with it. Mm-hmm. And in painting, we talk about getting in there and starting, creating mm-hmm. many starts, painting a lot, painting every day if you can, mm-hmm. because the pros paint a lot. Mm-hmm. And, and it's by getting in there and doing it, by facing it, that you, as you keep grappling with yourself, you you get more resilient at this. You strengthen yourself, whether you're a a swimmer and you need to go to the pool and swim every day, or you're an artist or you're an actor, whatever it is, you've, that's why you've got to show up and get on the work Mm -hmm. so that you can wrestle with this. What do you do on your bad days? Well, on bad days, I love to go for walks. Now I go on walks on good days too, Mm -hmm. (laughs) but walks are so powerful for me. So I love to walk because that opens it up for me. It gives me a lot of space of almost like meandering and wandering Mm -hmm. and wondering as well. Mm -hmm. And and perspective probably, you know, it's like getting out of your head, getting out of the canvas, lifting your head up. It really is, Elle. And the other piece that's powerful for me is The cello, I I started learning cello when I was 50, and just for the sake of learning something new, and that that also takes me outside of my head, too. It's a different experience from painting. Yeah, that's, yeah. I mean, and really walking as well. It's like getting the body involved. Yes. Tell me about the and I'm sorry, I don't have this, the adjacent possibility. Yeah. What's the adjacent possibility? Because I know you talk a lot about activating the canvas, activating your inner artist, your inner journey. So I'd love to hear sort of your philosophy on how you guide people through this process. Okay. So let me back up then and, and tell you about something that came to me quite recently I was trying to hone it down, simplify it down to the elegant solution of, okay, what is it that we're doing here? How can I understand the life cycle of what's going on for artists to try to help them through this process? And so I, I developed something called the IC creativity methodology. So I S E E is the acronym. So the I is the overarching inner journey that our psychology psychology affects everything, how we think about ourselves, how we talk to ourselves, the inner narrative, all of that, the inner landscape. And then there's three actions that are happening that I see in artists. So the first one is start, mm-hmm. and that maps onto a mathematical concept of zero to one, which is the enormity of going from zero to one is, is actually that interval is bigger than one to two, mm. two to three, three to four, and so on. Going from nothing to something is larger than something to something. And this has been proven mathematically um, that actually zero to one is infinite. So starting lots of starts, not, not reducing down, not trying to finish things so quickly, keeping it open, opening those creative channels by lots of starts, miles of canvas. It's kind of like miles in your boots if you're a skier or hours on the cello if you're a cellist. So start. Then the, and so, so we, we get started and we're like, wow, I'm really going for this and this is fantastic. But then a problem arises. And the problem that starts to arise for artists is emulating others. Mm. Okay, so at first, you know, that's kind of okay at first because you're learning and you've got to learn somehow. And so we, you know, there that happens. But eventually that gets to be uh, not gratifying. And so then what? Well, then I believe after start is experiment. Mm -hmm. And so if we can access experimentation, which is the ability to ask what if? And the ability to allow for the ugly art to emerge, the uncomfortable, unfamiliar to emerge, 
then that gets you past emulating others because then you are going to that edge of the unknown. You're stepping into the unknown. And then what happens is I see artists embrace experimentation and then they're on fire with that. And people are going, wow, that's fantastic. Your art is so exciting. And they're selling out their solo exhibition and they're like, I've got this. This is fantastic. But then another fear arises, another problem arises, and that is, yes, you're experimenting wildly. However, now the problem is not that you're emulating others, but rather you're emulating yourself. Mm. Because what happens there, Elle, is that we start to win. We I call it a success disaster where, <laughs> you know what I mean, we're, we're winning. <laughs> And it's like, oh, wow, I love that painting. Do you think I can do that again? Right. Maybe I can do another painting just like that, that one that's sold. Maybe I can do a whole series that sells out again. And, and then what happens is we fear and arises and we start to repeat ourselves. Mm. So it's not complacency. It's not like a plateau. It's fear of continuing. Yeah, because mm-hmm. it, it really... This is what happens, and this happens along the path as you keep going, is you'll create this amazing painting, and then the fear arises, oh, is that a one-off? Can right, I can I again? do this again? Yeah. Yeah, or is that just a one-trick pony? Right. And so that fear arises for very, uh, you know, advanced, experienced artists, especially when they get known Mm-hmm. And it can stop them in their tracks and they just start repeating themselves. They won't get off the dime. And I've seen this with amazing artists and mm-hmm. it's deadening. It is mm-hmm. deadening. And I know as a as an actress, we always say you're either on your way up or on your way down. <laughs> wow. <laughs> you know? So there's that fear of like, okay, am I on my way up here or is this like yes. the turning? What part of the trajectory am I on here? Right, right. <laughs> so, so here's where... The next piece is this third piece, evolve. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. evolve and and extrapolating from theoretical evolutionary biology, a concept called the adjacent possible. And it was, it was developed by my partner, Dr. Bruce Sawhill and Dr. Stuart Kaufman at the Santa Fe Institute in the nineties. And it's the concept that I'm extrapolating it over to creativity, but it's the concept that, when you make a move on your canvas, you make a stroke, you make a move, that move, that action opens up a p- series of paths of possibilities that were not only invisible before, but didn't exist before. Mm. Your action creates existence itself and its co creation. It's co-evolution. You are evolving that work of art. You're deeply in the unknown and your action opens up almost like a web of possibilities that didn't exist before. Right. Just by taking the step. Yes. Yeah. And so when you really kind of start to get that, Mm -hmm. that... That's scary though. <laughs> that and you know it's and I I feel like all of this is so applicable to our lives. Especially in the midst of this crazy uncertainty that we're living in currently with COVID and and all that we knew has changed, some for amazingly good and some for we don't know yet. Yes. Um but it's the ability to move yes and embrace the unknown Mm -hmm. and embrace creativity and innovation and embrace so-called mistakes and ugly art Mm -hmm. which translates over to you know so-called mistakes in life Uh, but this is where innovation comes and this is where people get stuck yes is to they fall back on replicating what already is Mm -hmm. and I I talk about who's saying what's on the menu are you just 
allowing someone else to dictate what is on the menu or are you writing the menu for yourself mm. continually and continually evolving that? So there's this really interesting story that relates to this. Of um, There was a Danish architect named Jorn Utzen, and this, this was at a time when they were, there was a um, contest for the Sydney Opera House. Okay, this is before the Sydney Opera House was, you know, built. And he came from, he had an idea. And his idea was based on this concept, it's French, the monocoque. And the monocoque is kind of this all-in-one piece. It's like the shape of the egg. This, you know, that this form is perfect. And the monocoque idea had been used in kayaks and single hull boats and in aircraft. And he took this big idea and he translated it into architecture. He had a vision of this structure that had never been built before, nothing like it ever, with the eggshell type structure, almost like a sail type structure as well. And he didn't know how it was going to be built. And in fact, they had a lot of problems. He won the exhibition. He won the competition. But then they didn't know what to do. They had to bring in structural engineers. And, and now, you know, you know what the results are. It's mm-hmm. probably the most famous st- modern structure of our century. Mm-hmm. And, and unique. It's so unique because he didn't just go along with what had been done before. He broke the rules. He came from the big concepts rather than just surface techniques, rather than the typical structure based off of what was done going back to medieval times. He actually did something very different. And so that's what creativity asks of us is to stand in our own shoes and break the so-called rules that other people have laid down. Mm -hmm. So my question then is, how do we take that first step? How do we get past that self-doubt, that fear to make that move to that adjacent possibility? Because I speak with so many women who they know that what they're doing or where they are isn't where they want to stay. And they don't, either there's the fear of taking that action. How do you do that? Yes. You see, it comes back to psychology. Mm -hmm. It comes back to the inner journey, Mm -hmm. to the inner landscape, to your narrative, to what you're saying to yourself. And, And we get at, really, we're talking about a growth mindset, Carol Dweck's work at Stanford on growth versus static mindset. Yeah. It really comes down to that inner narrative of what are you saying to yourself with a growth mindset? You're saying I can do this. It's possible to improve. It's possible to learn something new. So there's the head knowing of that and there's the, you know, the, the thinking, but then how does it become understanding and like, Yes. Possible because it's not just in our head, it's in our heart. It's the emotional piece Mm -hmm. that we've got to grapple with. So part of that is working with, yes, the cognitive, which is what you're saying to yourself, noticing what you're saying to yourself, but also it's taking that step. It's putting your toe in the water and you know, it depends. Everyone's different on this. If you've had a lot of support in your life, you've had, you've had relationships, secure attachments. I believe that makes it easier. Um, And, and yet, even if you haven't had that, if you can find someone who can help support you, that can be very helpful Mm -hmm. because it is scary. Mm-hmm. And really, we're so fearful of failure, of embarrassment, of um, in all of that. And really, I would say that we're so afraid of 
what others will think, but really the problem is what you think. Mm-hmm. And and I think you, I think it was something you said or something. Um, I've heard someone else say that it's basically in the end, what's it going to matter, right? Like it's seeing that big picture. It's seeing that what's it, what's at stake on a large scale, not just what's what's at stake in this one action or this one step. Um, yeah, and it's the and you said it also by saying it's a dipping of the toe. It's the it's that tiny step and then the continual process of you know the willingness to step into the newness the willingness to keep going um and remembering and reminding ourselves it's ongoing yeah it it keeps arising that Mm -hmm. ugly monster of fear and self-doubt keeps arising Mm -hmm. and so it really is it becomes a kind of practice of self-compassion Mm -hmm. and working with self-compassion. I love the work of David White and John O'Donohue, poets. John's no longer living, but they they did a lot of work on the poetry of Mm self-compassion and listening to those kinds of recordings can be helpful. Mm -hmm. Whatever it is that helps one to, you know, kind of shore up, yourself so that you can face these fears Mm -hmm. and when you understand that this is natural you're not alone Mm -hmm. and you know I do a lot of work with artists on embracing ugly art ugly art because I believe if you know when the artist can really get that and get the value of it Mm -hmm. all of a sudden it's there's a levity and they start laughing and it's actually not so unbearable to get in there and have a quote unquote failure. Mm -hmm. And you really see the value in that. The more you get in there, those little steps. And if you can have somebody holding your hand, that's fine. That's really what I'm doing is helping people Mm -hmm. continually holding their hand in a way to go ahead and take those risks, allow for the ugly art to emerge and keep going. Mm -hmm. anyway and then feeding yourself like you said feeding yourself words of compassion you know the reminding of yourself that it's a process because it's the inner critic the ego the head that wants to come in and attack yes Mm -hmm. you know what it is is i is that this is what i've seen for years in psychiatry is that a person might come in and say you know so and so said this terrible thing about me and it just feels so awful and we look at it and yes somebody said something okay and yeah people in as an artist there're going to be plenty of people who criticize your art or don't like it or feel ho hum about it whatever that's their issue the issue is when a part of you joins their criticism Mm. and then you're fighting yourself because there's this part of you back here that's going no 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 really i think it's good and then this other part of you has joined them and says yeah this isn't good and you're fighting not them but yourself yeah so it's a bill the kind of the ability to detach a little yeah step back evoke the witness the observer Mm -hmm. that's mindfulness that's bringing in mindfulness Mm -hmm. and really with the mindfulness we want to bring in Mm self-compassion. So a lot of the work I do with artists and in with clients in psychotherapy is, is cultivating Mm self-compassion. And it's a practice. Mm -hmm. You have to practice it. It doesn't necessarily just happen. Mm -hmm. So good. I could talk to you for hours. I'm so fascinated in your approach um, to creativity, to art, to, I think, really growth you talked about a growth mindset and evolving and developing as the most authentic version of ourselves which I think is expressed through our creativity but if you're not specifically a creative like you're not an I mean I believe and I think you said too everyone is an artist there's there's creativity within each of us due to just the the design who we are as you know designed human beings Um, but even in just 
life. Some of the things you talked about are so, so valuable. Thank you so much. Yeah. Oh, I love your thoughtfulness and I, I love this creative conversation we're having. Yeah. So Nancy, if people want to learn more or they want to take part in one of your courses or um, even, I mean, reach out to you, I guess, are you still doing, do you still do psychotherapy? I do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I'd love for people to be able to reach out to you for, for more, more support information. Thank you. Yes. So I can be found at artistsjourney.com, artistsjourney.com, or nancyhillis.com will also take you to my website, and it's all there. Mm -hmm. And you have a ton of free resources. Yes, I do. And so you can find that on the website. You can get free worksheets. I've got a free seven-day email course, which many people have enjoyed. Um, all kinds of goodies are there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're very generous with your you. with your knowledge and your wisdom. And then you have some exciting things coming. Some new. I mean, you have your course, but you have some new new projects coming, right? I sure do. So right now, one of the things that's happening is I'm working on a new book that will be coming out probably by January. Mm -hmm. And this will be about the adjacent possible. And that's January 2021 for those of you who, you know, are in a different, listening at a different time. Yes. And then the other thing is I am launching a program called Studio Journey Masterclass. And I'm so excited about this program. It will begin in January 2021. And we are having artists joining us right now as we're moving into this launch. And this is a it's a 12-week intensive program, and then you have a year of ongoing support, and I get in there and have live calls, and we explore deep uh, principles and concepts in abstract painting, mm -hmm. and always is the inner journey, the adjacent possible, and this icy creativity methodology threaded through the whole program. Yay. So good. So, so, so good. Well, Nancy, it was a pleasure connecting with you today. And I really look forward to see what's coming in January. And thank you for joining me. Thank you so much, Elle. And I appreciate you and the beautiful and meaningful work you're doing to help thank you. women. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So Clara, I love how she talked about making ugly art. Have you ever made ugly art? Oh my gosh, so many times. I think I've made ugly art that I've sort of made as a joke, like the little doodles. And then when I was actually like starting to get into watercolor painting, the first few pages of my notebook are hilarious to me now. But it's really a great reminder of where I started. Yeah, I have a lot of ugly art. <laughs> and how do you feel about it? Well, it's what's a challenge to me is that sometimes we like to post my painting on Instagram, mm -hmm. and boy, People does, love it all. Well, thank you, but it's always mm -hmm. so vulnerable to post mm -hmm. the pictures that are in process or they're not really that good. And the thing that she talked about that just freed me up is that that is just part of the process. And of course, we say that and we hear that. But it's like the more you start and the more ugly art, the closer you get, the sooner you get to something that is beautiful. Yeah, it's almost like instead of a completion medal, it's like the ugly art is your starting <laughs> medal. <laughs> Thank you for framing it that way. <laughs> So but yeah, I love this episode. Super inspiring. It actually totally reminds me in so many ways of the creative uncovery process that you lead your clients through. And I love creative uncovery because it's really not just about finding yourself as an artist. It's about finding and creating your most authentic life. 
getting back in touch with what you love and what you want and how you make decisions to really help you create a next step that feels like you and feels creative and expressive and like who you are made to be. And I've just had so much fun, Elle, working on this with you. So listener, if you are interested in Creative Uncovery, it's a coaching process And if you want to learn more, you can schedule a clarity call with Elle and it's super easy to do that. You can just go to lzimmerman.com, scroll down a little bit, and then we have clarity call on the dark blue banner and you can learn more about how Elle can help you step into your most authentic life. Thank you so much for joining us on this episode of She Made It. Have a great day.